The Book of Enoch seems to be one of the most popular extra-biblical books from the ancient world. Many are fascinated by what this book says and the influences it had on the culture and biblical canon. Some people go so far as to say that this book is inspired by God and should be part of the Bible and dates back to Enoch himself. But is this all true? Or is Enoch just another late document that was never considered scripture? The Book of Enoch, or First Enoch, is a book that is probably a collection of different writings later compiled together. The only complete copy is preserved in a late 15th to 20th century manuscript written in an Ethiopic language. However, we have found various Greek, Coptic, and Latin fragmented manuscripts. Additionally, fragments in Aramaic have been found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. Overall, the content of Enoch most likely matches the time period between 400 BC and 200 AD. Many of the documents written during this time were referred to as pseudepigrapha. James Sanders notes this term refers to early Jewish literature, largely in the 200 BCE to 200 CE period, that resembles the apocrypha or deuterocanonical literature, but is not included in the Jewish or Western Christian canons or in the rabbinic literature. George Nicholsberg and James Vanderkam summarize the teachings contained in this composite work. The sections represent developing stages of the Enochic tradition, each one building on the earlier ones, though not in the order in which they presently stand in the collection. Overall, they express a common worldview that characterizes this present world and age as evil and unjust and in need of divine adjudication and renewal. With the possible exception of the Book of the Luminaries, they focus on the common concern and expectation that a coming divine judgment will eradicate evil and injustice from the earth and will return the world to God's created intention. Their authority lies in their claim that they transmit divine revelation, which the patriarch Enoch received in primordial times, and which is made public in the last times to constitute the eschatological community of the chosen. In other words, the Book of Enoch was written and pieced together by multiple authors over a few centuries. The authors claim to have received special revelation from the patriarch Enoch, who ascended into heaven and was shown heavenly secrets concerning the end of the age, which they thought was imminent. The reason why we know it dates to this time period is because of various internal indicators. First, based upon the language, most of it was probably originally written in Aramaic and would fit with an Aramaic-speaking community that returned from the exile. It also reflects and matches themes from the same time period. James Charlesworth writes, The original language of First Enoch appears to be Aramaic, except for the Noah traditions, which were probably composed in Hebrew. The earliest portions display impressive parallels with the nascent thoughts of the Jewish sect which eventually settled at Qumran. Nothing we find in Enoch suggests a pre-exilic period or a culture from prior to that. Leonard Roast writes, The similitudes furnish information about the hierarchy of the angels and revealed atmospheric, meteorological, and astronomical secrets. They culminate in the appointment of Enoch as the Son of Man. They contain various traditions dating from the earlier ages but in their present recension cannot be designated earlier than the first century BC. J.T. Millick dates them as late as the second century CE, above all because there is no trace of them at Qumran. Within the final compilation of Enoch is also an historical commentary from Noah up until around the time of the Maccabean Revolt. Oddly, the retelling of Israel's history surprisingly stops here and doesn't go further like mentioning the coming of Rome or the later fall of Jerusalem, which is a key piece of data scholars use to suggest its sections were probably written around this time period. James Vanderkam also notes sections of Enoch make allusions to the work of Daniel and Jeremiah. Michael Nibb notes there are allusions to Isaiah and Daniel, which would show it's dependent on these earlier works. 
The opening of Enoch paraphrases sections of Deuteronomy and Numbers, and even mentions Mount Sinai, which would not have been sacred until long after Enoch existed. Leonard Roast notes some sections seem to date to just prior to the Maccabean Revolt, but others contain an account of history from Adam to the Hasmoneans and concludes with a vision of the Messianic Age. And so some sections would best fit with just after the Maccabean Revolt. George Nicholsburg notes the first section of Enoch has strong indications it is based on the Diadochi Wars, implying it could not have existed before this time period. The second section seems to mention an event that happened just before the reign of Herod the Great, dating that section to around the same time period. See, virtually across the board, all scholars agree Enoch was written around this time period and not from some earlier era. So there is no reason to suggest it would date back thousands of years to the historical Enoch. For this to be remotely possible, the text would need to have some Akkadian or Sumerian cognates or some indications of an ancient culture. Instead of reflecting an Aramaic-speaking time period and events that surrounded the Maccabean Revolt and other wars from the century before Herod the Great. Regarding the composition, it is divided into seven sections composed at different times. The first is called the Book of the Watchers. This section gives an elaborate interpretation of Genesis 6, telling the story of fallen angels called the Watchers, who rebelled against God, and then God brings Enoch into the heavenly realm and commissions him to prophesy concerning the Watchers' coming judgment. The second section is the Book of Parables. Michael Heiser writes, This is the longest section of First Enoch, dominated by three extended parables that deal with, and slightly alter, the account of Enoch's vision during his heavenly journey. In these parables, Enoch is shown visions of a future messianic figure known by several names, Son of Man, Chosen One, Anointed One, and the Righteous One. The third section of the Book of Enoch is called the Book of the Luminaries, which according to scholars is likely the earliest of the Enochic literature. This section focuses on explaining the astronomical laws governing the solar calendar that was favored by the sectarian community that produced and followed the Enochic traditions. The fourth section is called the Dream Visions. According to scholars, the present form of this section dates anywhere between 200 and 160 BC. In this section, Enoch tells Methuselah about two prophetic dreams. The first dream speaks about the flood of Noah. The other one is an allegorical telling of human history, from Adam to the Maccabean Revolt and then followed by Final Judgment. This section is referred to as the Animal Apocalypse. The fifth section is called the Epistle of Enoch. This section consists of Enoch's exhortation to remain righteous during a wicked generation. The section closes with explicit reference to the transmission of Enoch's teaching. In the end time, his book will be given to the righteous and will be a source of wisdom, faith, and joy, and they will serve as a testimony to the children of earth. The sixth section is called the Book of Noah, which details Noah's unusual birth story. The author writes about Noah's face and hair glowing white, and that he immediately stands up from the hands of the midwife and praises the Lord. The seventh and last section is simply called Another Book of Enoch, which is an additional exhortation from Enoch to his son Methuselah regarding God's judgment in the end times. So as you can see, Enoch is probably a compilation of several works over several decades or centuries, with the core having been written around the time of the Maccabean Revolt. This collection is very valuable in helping us gain a better understanding of the historical and cultural context of the biblical world. However, there are some that argue Enoch should be considered sacred scripture. Well, other than the fact that it is a late document and most definitely doesn't go back to the historical Enoch, there are additional reasons that show it should not be part of scripture. First, from what we can gather, no early Jewish author considered Enoch to be authoritative scripture, like with how the works of Jeremiah or Isaiah were viewed. For the ancient Jewish authors, the biblical canon had a threefold division, known as the Law, 
prophets and writings. That was, and basically still is, the shape of the Old Testament canon of scripture. It is known by the acronym Tanakh. For instance, Ben Sirah, the author of the Apocrypha book The Wisdom of Sirach, had a grandson who translated his writings into Greek around 130 BC. The grandson wrote a prologue to the translation, wherein he makes reference to the threefold shape of the Old Testament canon. The author distinguishes his grandfather's writings, the wisdom of Sirach, from the law itself and the prophecies and the rest of the books. That is, the law, the prophets, and writings. So it seems by 130 BC, the books contained in the threefold canon were already widely considered to be uniquely sacred and distinct from additional writings, including the apocrypha works. No manuscript or historical evidence ever indicates that pseudepigrapha, like the Book of Enoch, was ever accepted as part of this threefold canon. It is not in the Greek Septuagint or the Hebrew Masoretic texts. Second, Josephus in a passage from Against Appion wrote that a defined Hebrew canon already existed by his time. Josephus limits the number of books to a specific number, 22. Five books, he says, are of the books of Moses, 13 are of the prophets, and the remaining four, he says, are hymns to God and precepts for human life. Now, just so you know, the Jewish canon today has 24 books, which matches the content of our canon of 39 books. The reason for the difference is that the Jewish canon combines books that are separated in the Christian canons. For example, in the Jewish canon, all the minor prophets are combined into one book, but the contents of both canons are exactly the same. Either way, Josephus gives us no reason to think Enoch was ever considered scripture. Next, the gospel authors also seem to affirm the canon of their day, and they do this by quoting Jesus directly. Luke 24 reads, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. So Jesus seems to endorse the same threefold biblical canon, which according to primary evidence from that time period, excluded the book of Enoch. Further evidence of this is seen in Matthew 23, when Jesus speaks of all the righteous blood being poured out on the religious leaders of his day, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah. Scholar Roger Beckwith writes, His utterance about the righteous blood from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, which is found in Matthew 23.35 and Luke 11.51, in all probability implies that for Jesus and his hearers, the canon began with Genesis and ended with Chronicles. Seeing that the murder of Abel is recorded near the beginning of the former book, and the murder of Zechariah near the end of the latter book, this appears to reflect the traditional Jewish arrangement of the books, whereby Chronicles is not placed with Samuel and Kings in the second group of books, but is put in the third and last group as its concluding item. So this evidence would suggest that the Old Testament canon was already closed by the time of Christ, and there is no indication that the Book of Enoch was ever considered to be part of it. Next, another issue arises because the Book of Enoch identifies Enoch himself as the Messiah instead of Jesus. In the Book of Parables, Enoch is taken into heaven where he has shown prophetic visions concerning a future messianic figure. At the end of this section, Enoch states this, and the head of days came with Michael and Raphael and Gabriel and Phanuel and thousands and tens of thousands of angels without number. And he came to me and greeted me with his voice and said to me, You are that son of man who was born for righteousness and righteousness dwells on you and the righteousness of the head of days will not forsake you. So Enoch is identified as the very messianic figure that he had seen in his visions. Earlier in 1st Enoch 46, the Messianic Son of Man is described in these exact terms. So the Patriarch Enoch is called the Son of Man and is described with the same attributes applied to the Son of Man of his visions. 
Obviously, this puts the teachings of the Book of Enoch in direct conflict with the teachings of the New Testament. Now, some might point to a 1912 translation by R. H. Charles, which has this verse identifying the Son of Man in the third person rather than in second person. So instead it reads, this is the Son of Man, implying that Enoch is not being revealed as his messianic figure, but is being directed to a separate figure. However, Charles' translation of this passage is unanimously rejected by the scholarly community. Charles made the change because he thought it was odd that Enoch didn't recognize himself throughout the book of parables as he's being shown visions of the Messiah. Because of this, Charles theorized that there was a lost passage that revealed the Son of Man as someone other than Enoch. Then based on his speculative theory, he amended his translation to reflect a third-person rendering rather than what the manuscript actually recorded. Leslie Walk writes, Charles' solution was to amend the text of 1 Enoch 71.14 to the third person instead of the second person. Thus Charles read, This is the Son of Man, rather than, You are the Son of Man. Then he made the necessary changes in the rest of the text to bring it into harmony with the third person rendering. He also suggested that a paragraph which revealed the identity of the Son of Man has been lost. But this extensive emendation has no surviving textual basis in any of the manuscripts and for this reason is to be rejected. As Walk explains, the biggest problem with Charles' translation is that there is no evidence to substantiate his theory of a missing passage on which his translation is based. For this reason, modern Enochic scholarship universally rejects Charles' translation of this passage. And so we have every reason to believe that the passage is claiming Enoch is the Messiah. And that, of course, presents a big conflict between the Book of Enoch and the New Testament. Finally, there were very few early church fathers, Jewish authors, or Christians in general who have ever accepted Enoch as scripture. This book has almost been unanimously rejected throughout the centuries. Some might point to the Ethiopian church, which includes the book of Enoch in their canon. But what a lot of people don't realize is that the Ethiopian church has a much more liberal and fluid concept of canon than the rest of Christianity. As Roger Crowley writes, in Ethiopia, the concept of canonicity is regarded more loosely than it is among other churches. Daniel Asefa says, One can say that Enoch and Jubilees are in the canon, although we need to be careful in our use of the term canon. The concept of canon is not as rigid as it is in the West. You have various lists and no one seems to be worried or to be preoccupied to have something definitive or normative. In fact, when you study further, you can see that Enoch is included in some lists of Ethiopian canon, but excluded on others. Also, in terms of the Old Testament books, Enoch is excluded from holy books of the Old Testament within the Ethiopian church. So it could hardly be said to be on par with the Old Testament prophets or writings. Some argue that Enoch is considered scripture within the Qumran community, but this is also false. Roger Beckwith demonstrated that the Essenes adhere to the three divisions of the canon and the standard count of the canonical books. Even though three of the sections of 1st Enoch had been written by the time the Essenes split from the other Jewish communities, the Essenes never attempted to include the Enochic writings in their canon, but grouped them in a separate appendix. Beckwith says, The use by the Therapidae, or the Essenes, of the standard three divisions of the canon, and of one of the standard counts of the canonical books, and their grouping of their own pseudopigrapha in a separate appendix, imply that the three sections and the standard count were already agreed and settled among the Jews before the Essenes separated from the rest about 152 BC. Three of the books of 1st Enoch had been written by that time, but the Essenes had evidently not attempted to include them in any of the three sections of the canon, or to number them in the count of their canonical books. So the Dead Sea Scroll community did not consider the Book of Enoch on the level of scripture, even though they highly regarded it. Finally, 
What about the New Testament? Jude quotes directly from Enoch, and other New Testament authors allude to it. If Enoch is not scripture, why is it quoted in the New Testament? Dr. Michael Heiser responds to this by noting, just as preachers today quote commentaries, journals, news periodicals, and even television shows to drive home or illustrate a point, so the biblical writers use external material to draw attention and make a statement. Paul quotes from pagan Greek poets. The psalmists and prophets borrow vocabulary and paraphrase material from ancient Egyptian, Mesopotamian, and Syrian literature. Jew quotes a book from the Pseudepigrapha, ancient writings that falsely claim authorship by a biblical character. The people of biblical times knew the quoted material wasn't inspired, but it had meaning for them and their audience. In other words, the biblical author's use of Enoch is best compared to other instances where they used extra biblical material to drive home a point. As Heiser explains, their use of extra biblical material does not require that the authors believe the material was inspired. It would be like a pastor today quoting a popular movie. Plus, in Acts 17, Paul quotes pagan works to make a point in Athens, but that doesn't mean pagan literature is scripture. Some might point to Matthew 22, where the Sadducees ask Jesus a question in an attempt to trap him. Jesus responds with, you are wrong because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. Then it appears he references the book of Enoch. So wouldn't this imply Jesus thought Enoch was scripture? Well, this would be to quote mine the passage. When Jesus used the scriptures, he quoted from them directly. In verse 30, he doesn't say something like, have you not read? But simply states a fact about the resurrection that he is aware of. Then we see the scriptures he is referring to, which is brought up in verse 31 to 32. If Jesus was quoting from 1st Enoch, he would have quoted it directly, like he does just after this with Exodus 3, 6. And he would have done so by saying something like, it is written, or have you not read? Instead, in verse 30, Jesus' reference about the resurrected body is just a fact he is aware of that was also common in Jewish thought and it is not just contained to the book of Enoch. So it is not something he is saying he is getting from the scriptures. The scriptures he is referring to are clearly brought up after this and directly quoted, and first Enoch isn't quoted here. Thus, in conclusion, we can't appreciate the book of Enoch for what it is, but we must also recognize what it is not. The book of Enoch is not authoritative scripture. There is no evidence it was significant to Christ or the apostles, and it even contradicts their teachings in some places. Enoch gives us valuable insight concerning the beliefs of the culture and the time period that produced it. But the same culture also reveals they did not consider it to be the word of God. <laughs>